So hello and welcome to episode four in our third series of third season of Rock to the Cloud. Let me start by once again offering a massive thanks to you all for staying with us on this series. As we say every week, we really love spending this time with you to discuss all topics around Windows Server 2022 and Microsoft Hybrid Cloud Solutions. Although, as you probably gauge by now, this series has been a lot more focused on the latter. And quite frankly, this week is no different. So uh, in each episode of From Rock to the Cloud, we bring you some of the world's most foremost figures in Windows Server and Hybrid to help you get whatever you need or just what you want to know about it. And per the usual, if you have any questions about the episode, make sure you pop them into the comments section below. We'd love to hear from you. So the agenda for today's episode is Azure Kubernetes Service and Azure Stack HCI. And for the next 30 minutes, I'll be catching up with Vinicius Apollinario. I'm just making sure I've got that correct. I can see a nod there, which is good. And yeah. we've also got some elements later that you guys can get involved with. So do stick around. Yeah. So here on From Rock to the Cloud, we like to bring to you the world's leading voices in Windows Server and of course, Microsoft Hybrid. And today is no exception. On today's episode, we are joined by the one and only Vinicius Apollinario. Vinicius, can you introduce yourself to the audience watching, please? Hi, Jason, of course. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I'm Vinicius. I work as a cloud advocate uh, at Microsoft, and we cover everything about hybrid cloud, uh, on-premises infrastructure like Windows Server that Jason just mentioned. Uh, my focus specifically is more on containers, Kubernetes, uh, but from the IT pro and operations angle. Um, and I've been working with containers uh, for a few years. I was part of the uh, the product team that actually built containers inside of Microsoft um, and now joined the, the Cloud Advocates team. Wow, excellent. And where are you based, Vinicius? I'm based in Redmond, but I'm from Brazil. Uh, so yeah, we were just joking about the weird name that probably not familiar to a lot of people, uh, for a person that is from Come Brazil, on, living us, in the give, US. Give, <laughs> give us the story. Give us the story. <laughs> All right. So my first name is Vinicius. That's kind of Greek orange. Uh, my middle name is Ramos, which is from Portugal. Uh, my last name is Apollinario, which is Italian. I'm from Brazil and I live in the US. So of course, when someone at a Starbucks asks, what is your name, sir? I don't have a good name <laughs> to give to the person so they can find me later or, or write my name uh, correctly. <laughs> So as we said previously, in true hybrid fashion, right? Yeah. Right. So <laughs> perfect. Listen, thank you for joining us once again. Um, so why don't we jump into today's topic, uh, which I repeat is Azure Kubernetes Service and Azure Stack HCI. So I've got some questions yep. um, that I'd like to ask you, if that's OK, like we do in every episode. Um, and of course, in previous episodes in this series, we have heard about Azure, Azure Kubernetes. Uh, or AKS, as we like to call it here at Microsoft, and of course, as you're stuck HCI. But can you please tell me what does it mean to have AKS on Azure Stack from your perspective? Yep, of course. So uh, Kubernetes is uh, for those folks on the uh, watching our video that don't know what Kubernetes is. A brief introduction. So when you move from VMs to containers. Um, your compute mode changes from running single instances of an entire operating system to running now a isolated environment where the application is completely isolated from the others. Um, and what the main changes for someone in operations and as an IT pro is that a VM, you give it a name, uh, you treat that VM as an entire operating system, you have to manage, you have to backup and everything else. A container is a more a uh, short-lived instance, if you will, for your application to run. Uh, you don't have any ties uh, in terms of storage or name of the container itself. Uh, it's a very agnostic way of running your application because everything that matters for the application is not exactly inside of the container. So you can spin up the container real, real quickly. Um, and it's a new uh, uh, paradigm of running your application in terms of compute, right? Uh, where Kubernetes comes in is that because of that shift, you need something to orchestrate. The orchestrator is responsible for that and Kubernetes uh, ends up being the de facto uh, 
uh, orchestrator that most of the companies out there today are using uh, for running uh, uh, in production with containers, right? Of course, you can run Windows applications, Linux applications on top of Kubernetes, on top of Windows containers or Linux containers, and so on and so on. But the main goal of Kubernetes is to actually manage the nodes that are running your containers, manage the containers, scale up, scale down, um, high availability, load balancing, network policies, monitoring, and everything else comes on top of uh, Kubernetes. Uh, given the fact that Kubernetes is a big solution for you to manage, a lot of companies such as Microsoft have their own, what we call managed service uh, or Kubernetes managed service, right? What that means is that instead of spinning up VMs to run your Kubernetes cluster itself, uh, you then give that operation to Microsoft and you actually run the clusters that are running the application itself. So you don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure, right? Um, different companies will have uh, different ways that you can actually go and uh, what level of control you have for the VMs or the Kubernetes cluster or the management itself. Uh, but as you, we were saying, uh, Azure Kubernetes service is the Microsoft uh, version of that where you can run a Kubernetes cluster on top of Azure and you basically delegate the underlying infrastructure to Microsoft. So what happens is many customers, they have uh, requirements for running their applications on premises, right? Uh, and that uh, uh, even with that, they still want to run those applications uh, on top of Kubernetes. And also, if you think about the whole uh, infrastructure that is needed for running Kubernetes itself, uh, those customers also want a managed experience where part of that infrastructure is actually uh, Remember, it's on-premises, so they're still going to manage that, um, but it's at least uh, formatted in a way that is easier for them to go and deploy uh, and, and manage and everything else. So that's what AKS on top of Azure Stack HCI is. It's our Kubernetes managed service going on-premises, and the place where it's going to run, it's on top of Azure Stack HCI, right? So Azure Stack HCI mm -hmm. comes in mm -hmm. providing the... Uh, the um, high availability, uh, multi-node cluster, uh, where you can go and deploy your Kubernetes infrastructure then, that then operates to control your uh, uh, Windows containers or Linux containers and run your application on-premises. So essentially extending the whole scenario, right? That's correct, yes. Excellent. So why would I choose Azure Kubernetes Service HCI over other Kubernetes options? Yeah. So um, remember that Kubernetes is an open uh, uh, source project, right? Uh, it has a gazillion components that are needed to actually run your Kubernetes infrastructure. So you have the deployment of your Kubernetes cluster. And as part of that, you have your API cluster, you have your nodes, you have uh, management, you have to think about security, you have to think about updating the nodes. Uh, there's a bunch of components that are part of running your Kubernetes infrastructure itself. Um, mm -hmm. And when you go out and you deploy the simple version, or as we call it, the vanilla version of Kubernetes, where you just go to kubernetes.io uh, and you get the, the, the binaries and deploy, um, that's all open source. So you have community support, uh, amazing product and amazing community, actually. However, mm -hmm. when you think about enterprises running their most critical workloads, it's important for those companies to have some support for, from a vendor. Uh, so that's one of the things that comes uh, for Microsoft, right? Uh, not only the support is all Microsoft, but also all the components needed to run your Kubernetes environment then are now provided by Microsoft, tested by Microsoft, uh, and supported by Microsoft. Uh, that's one gotcha. of the main things that we uh, uh, are seeing customers really see the value of running AKS on top of HCI uh, for their on-premises workloads on Kubernetes. So it's fair to say but I mean, kind of package the whole solution, right? That's correct, yes. But I mean, uh, at the end of the day, nothing better than actually seeing what that means in, in a demo, right? Uh, and I know people in this audience like to see the product running. So let me uh, dive into the demo itself. Excellent. Good. 
So the first thing I wanted to show is that uh, everything that I'm going to show in terms of demo, people can reproduce on top of a testing environment, right? Uh, and what that means is we mm -hmm. talked about how uh, AKS on, on Azure Stack HCI is for on-premises, but maybe you want to test mm -hmm. AKS on top of HCI and you don't even have an HCI cluster. You don't have a actual VM or machine that is actually powery enough, like 64 gigs, 128 gigs of memory to run multiple VMs that can actually go and, and try. So everything I'm going to show today is actually available for you to try on Azure. And we have a guide uh, for AKS on Azure Stack HCI uh, in Azure as an evaluation guide. What that means is that you will spin up a Azure VM and then you deploy AKS on HCI as if you were deploying on-premises, but it happens to be uh, an Azure VM. So it's a simple way for you to get started and try um, AKS on Azure Stack HCI. So with that said, let me go to Windows Admin Center, which I showed briefly. Uh, and Windows Admin Center is one of the ways you can go and manage uh, AKS on Azure Stack HCI. The other way is through PowerShell, but I'm going to show the uh, Windows Admin Center just because visually it's easier to understand and see what's going on. So here you can see I have a single node. Uh, like I said, for the purpose of this demo, uh, I want to show the Azure Kubernetes service running on premises. But in this case, it's running on top of a single node. However, if you deploy on Azure Stack HCI, the only difference is that the underlying infrastructure has HA or high availability available. That would be the only difference. Um, when I click Azure Kubernetes Service on top of this single node, it's going to gather the platform information. So basically what I did here is previously I used that evaluation guide to go and deploy. It takes uh, uh, some time to go and deploy, especially because uh, part of the process is to actually download from the Microsoft servers the images for the Windows nodes and the Linux nodes that you're going to run your applications on top of. Right. Uh, you can see that I have my cluster over here. I have a total disk space, how much memory I have available, the versions of AKS and Kubernetes. Uh, this is already synced to Azure. One of the ways we build customers on how they are using is through the compute nodes. Uh, and you have to sync with Azure in order for us to know uh, how much you're using and, and, and everything else. Uh, mm -hmm. This deployment of AKS has a, what we call as a target cluster. So think about AKS as um, your underlying infrastructure to run Kubernetes, but then you have to have your clusters that are actually the places where you are going to run the application itself. And that's what we are mm -hmm. seeing here, my Vini AP cluster. And basically this is running this uh, version of Kubernetes. The state is healthy, which is good. And I have two node pools, one for Linux and one for Windows. Um, mm -hmm. This is also connected to Azure Arc. We're going to talk about that uh, later. But now let me switch to uh, PowerShell so I can show some of the configuration that I have through the Kubernetes uh, configuration itself. And the tool we use for that in Kubernetes is called kubectl. Uh, some people call it kubectl, uh, whatever you prefer. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to say kubectl get nodes. And basically what I'm doing is I'm asking the output to show more information than it would uh, by default. So kubectl get nodes, it's going to show my nodes that are part of that cluster that I just said. You can see that I have the control plane that I was talking about, and then you have uh, one node dedicated for Linux containers and one node dedicated to Windows containers, right? One curious thing about what I'm just showing you here is that you see that I have a Mariner Linux. That's Microsoft's own distribution of Linux that is packed for AKS. Uh, so when you run Linux containers on top of AKS and Azure Stack HCI, you are running on top of a Microsoft Linux distribution. So that's to say we support the whole thing for the customers when you deploy your applications on top of AKS HCI. Um, all right, the other thing I wanted to show here is that in terms of cluster management, um, Azure Stack HCI, uh, I'm sorry, AKS on Azure Stack HCI has all the configuration uh, here on Windows Admin Center. So if I click, for example, the settings here, you can see I'm not gonna have any updates because there are none available for me right now. I have the latest.
updated in terms of the Kubernetes version of the uh, uh, or the nodes that are running uh, Windows or Linux, uh, those configurations will show up here. And, and I have an easy way to just go and update based on what Microsoft released for AKS on Azure Stack HCI. So as you can see, everything is very straightforward. Uh, one of the things about Kubernetes is, as I mentioned before, you have multiple components that you have to configure. Uh, um, you have to make sure that they are talking to each other. Everything is configured correctly. Uh, one of the benefits of using AKS on Azure Stack HCI is everything is very straightforward. The installation is very straightforward. You come to the Windows Admin Center UI, you have a step-by-step -step guidance uh, that takes you from deploying your cluster, deploying your target cluster, configuring the nodes, configuring the node pools, and then uh, you can go and deploy the applications itself. Excellent. No, thank you. That's an excellent demo. Um, I'm just curious, what kind of applications can be deployed? Um, I'm assuming it's not just for Windows only? Yeah. Or is it? So, uh, no. Uh, although it's a Microsoft product, you can run, as I mentioned, uh, Linux and Windows applications. It's just that when it comes to Kubernetes, you have node pools. And what node pools are, they are as the name says, actually, pools of servers that are supporting uh, uh, those types of applications. In Kubernetes, you create mm -hmm. pools for Linux workloads and pools for Windows workloads. You can't have a mixed version yeah. of node pools. Um, other than that, uh, you can deploy any application that was containerized, right? So, of course, not all applications can be containerized, but as long as application is running on containers, uh, you can go and deploy to AKS. Um, in fact, I have an example of an application that I deployed. So I'm going to switch back to the demo. And what I'm going to show you here is back to our PowerShell. You can see that I'm uh, on a folder here called Azure Vault. And that's a sample application that we have uh, to show how deploying applications to Kubernetes work. Uh, on this folder, I have a YAML file. So YAML files are used to describe how the Kubernetes config uh, configuration should be for my application to run. So if I look at this YAML file over here on Notepad, you can see that I have blocks of code and each of these blocks, they are part of a configuration on top of uh, Kubernetes and in this case, AKS HCI. So this first block basically deploys uh, a, uh, a type of deployment, which is basically a pod or a container. Uh, give it a name, how many replicas I should have. Uh, it gives the name for a label, which is Azure Vault Back. So my application is composed by a backend and a frontend. This is the backend. This is the image that we are going to use uh, for the application. Uh, it talks about how much CPU and memory. And as you can see, it goes on to the next block. And the next block is a service, services related to networking. So I have uh, the networking configuration of my backend. And then I have another deployment, which is my front end. And the front end uses a different image uh, and uses a different service as well. Uh, specifically for the front end, you can see the difference that we have a load balancer here. And if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, if you're not familiar with the YAML files, uh, don't get too, uh, uh, hanging to the complexity of the YAML file. A lot of this is documented and there's a bunch of example and sample files that you can reuse for your own application. And most of the time from an operations perspective, this YAML file will be provided for you by the developer of the application itself, describing how the application should work. And then it's your job as an operations person to go and work on how, much, how many resources, what are the namespaces that are going to be deployed, the namespaces being how you uh, contain your application into specific node pools or give access to some people and some uh, something like that. So with all that said, this YAML file over here describes how my application works. And now what I have to do is I have to go and deploy this YAML file to my Kubernetes cluster. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use kubectl again. I'm gonna say, apply for to apply my configuration and I'm going to pass on uh, dash F that specifies the file and the file I'm going to use here is Azure Vault YAML. So I'm going to click OK. You can see that nothing changed because in fact, I actually just deployed this application before the uh, and let's take a look at what was deployed to Kubernetes because I showed the YAML file is one thing, but showing on Kubernetes how this is deployed now is, is another. So I'm going to show you first 
the pods or the containers that I have running. So cube uh, CTL get pods. And as you can see, I have the back end and the front end. And the reason you see here that I have one of one is because if you remember the YAML file I showed before, um, it was saying one replica, right? So we're going to change that in a second. And basically what I have now is I have uh, one pod uh, of the one total that I asked for the application to have in terms of replica. Uh, it's running uh, for a few days uh, because I ran this uh, last week. Uh, let's take a look at the um, service configuration now. And as you can see, I have the load balancer here for the front end of my application. And because this is the front end with the load balancer, I have an external IP address. So my customers can go and connect you. So I'm going to open a new tab over here. And here's my application up and running. So it's a sample, uh, very simple application where you come here and you vote either cats or dogs. And uh, then the result of that uh, is recorded down here and I can reset the whole configuration and start voting again. So that's the deployment of a Linux application. It's actually very straightforward. Once you have your application uh, 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 containerized, ready to be deployed, uh, you apply the configuration of your application to Kubernetes. Kubernetes will basically um, uh, uh, try to apply exactly the configuration that you specified in your file to the configuration uh, on your cluster. So if you have multiple nodes, one of the nodes goes down, it will bring the node, the pod or the application to another node, spin it up, uh, high availability, load balancing, and, and all the things that we were talking about. Now, just for the sake of showing uh, how Kubernetes work in terms of how you uh, specify things on your YAML file, I'm going to change the number of replicas for my front end and my back end to two. I'm going to save this file. I'm going to provide the same kubectl apply here. Uh, there's a warning here about the specification. Uh, because it was deprecated in an earlier version. It doesn't change the fact that this was applied, so just ignore the warning. Um, and now let's take a look at the pods that I showed before. And you can see that I have now four pods in total, um, for, two for my back end and two for the front end. So in that way, so, I just scaled up my application by just changing the file of the application itself. Wow, you make it look all so simple. <laughs> For somebody <laughs> like myself, I'll be honest with you, I always get a little lost there. But, um, yeah. but I suppose from my own perspective as well, you know, from a, as, as I take it from many years ago, being at the command line was quite nostalgic, let me say. But look, <laughs> with it being an Azure product, can you elaborate on how the pricing works for Azure, uh, for Azure Kubernetes Service and HCI? And I'm assuming this is going to be quite an important question for the audience, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, I, I think I mentioned before, everything you run on Azure Kubernetes Service is uh, um, on, on Azure, Azure Stack HCI is based on your compute node. So whenever you deploy a cluster and then those clusters have nodes up and running, that's how you're going to be charged for Azure Stack HCI. I'm not going to go into yeah. the pricing itself. I'm going to talk about the model on how it works. So let me explain what we have here in terms of our cluster, right? So if you look at this Vini AP cluster, I have one uh, Linux node and one Windows node. Uh, so I have two nodes running over here. And when you deploy a cluster, you specify what is the size of the nodes that you want to deploy either for the Linux uh, node pools or Windows node pools. And when you create the node pool, you say, what is the size of the VMs you are going to run when you run VMs on that node pool, right? So getting out of AKS on Azure Stack HCI itself and showing the virtual machines I have running here, you see that I have a few VMs up and running. And those VMs are exactly the nodes that I showed before, but from the AKS perspective, and now I'm showing from the VM perspective on, um, on my environment, right? So look at this. I have my Vini AP cluster control plane. I have the load balancer. 
and I have this Windows Server pool and this Linux pool uh, VM over here. These two are the machines that are actually uh, being charged for AKS HCI to go and run. Uh, and what happens is you keep a connectivity to Azure. Let me go back to the AKS UI. There you go. So the synchronization to the cloud is the process of uh, showing to Microsoft what you have up and running in your environment. We have more details about this uh, in our documentation for AKS on HCI, uh, but that's basically how customers are going to be charged, uh, the size of the VMs and how many VMs you have up and running with AKS HCI. So yeah, um, so, yeah, so in, in just one other question then, in terms of scaling up and down, is does if, if you're going to sort of reduce your footprint or increase your footprint, how does that work? Does that come out of your Azure billing or is it something different? Yeah, remember that this is an Azure product, right? So it's Azure Kubernetes service on Azure Stack HCI. So it's Azure billing. Uh, and basically okay. you can scale up or down your pods or your containers, but that's not exactly going to affect the number of nodes you have running on your cluster, Indeed. right? So yeah. the number of nodes you have running is going to affect uh, the, the, the billing for Azure Stack HCI. I'm sorry, for AKS on Azure Stack HCI. <laughs> All a mouthful, right? Um, but and speaking right. of connectivity with Azure, can I, can I plug in Azure Arc on, on AKS? Yep. So we touched briefly on this. Azure Arc is available. Uh, if you're not familiar with Azure Arc, Azure Arc is basically a way for you to uh, show Azure what are the resources you have outside of the Azure environment itself. Uh, you have Azure Arc for servers. So if you have a VM or a physical server running on premises or in another cloud, you can use Azure Arc to apply Azure policies, configure tags or anything else mm -hmm. you want to configure that is available for that resource. One of the type of resources available for Azure Arc is Kubernetes. So we call it Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes. And AKS HCI is one of the Kubernetes cluster types that is supported with Azure Arc, right? So what that means is, as you see here, I can inform Azure, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the Azure cloud itself, not on-premises, but I can inform Azure that this Kubernetes cluster on-premises running on AKS HCI exists and manage that cluster via Azure. So let me show you what that means real quick. So as you can see, I already um, configured Azure Arc for this cluster. It, the configuration itself, it's honestly a very simple uh, uh, command that you run on PowerShell uh, from AKS HCI. Uh, and after that, it's going to show that it's connected. So if you go to Azure itself, of course, you'll have that tied to a um, uh, resource group. I'm using this Arc demo for this case. You can see that both of my cluster, the management cluster and the target cluster are showing up here. But of course, the one that we care about is a target cluster. Um, and look, this is a cluster that runs on premises that now I'm managing from the Azure portal, right? So right from the Azure portal, I have connectivity to the cluster and I have the information about the cluster right here. So remember that we showed uh, the Kubernetes version, the agent, uh, everything that I showed you from the Windows Admin Center uh, UI on premises, I can now see from the Azure portal. Now, that's just showing you some information. Uh, there are extensions that you can enable on top of a ARC enabled Kubernetes cluster, right? One of those being Azure Policy, for example. So let me show you what that means. If I go back here, you can see the whole extensions we have, like Open Service Mesh, GitOps. Some of these are pretty cool. So for example, GitOps. Let's say you have an application that your developer uh, put in a, a, on GitHub, for example, or in a Git repository. You can use GitOps for deploying the application to your Kubernetes cluster, and you can create something like a CI CD pipeline that says, Every time the application is updated, you're going to automatically deploys the applications or automatically or not, of course, um, deploys to your Kubernetes cluster. So you can integrate your AKS HCI with GitOps via Azure Arc. Uh, but let's go talk about policies, right? So uh, 
if you are familiar with Azure, you're probably familiar with Azure policy. It basically gives you the ability to, to centralize policies for configuring and monitoring your workloads or your resources on Azure. Uh, but in this case, we're doing this with an on-premise resource. So if I go to the Azure policy configuration here, you see that I have my uh, set of policies, the default one, and it's showing as non-compliant. So let's take a look at why this is saying non-compliant for this cluster. So I'm gonna open the configuration of the policies and just like any other set of default policies on Azure, you can see that I have a bunch of policies covering stuff like network security, uh, logging and threat detection. I have identity management, privileged access and so on and so on. So all of these are all pre-populated policies. I can have my own custom policies as well, of course. But the point here is that for this case, Azure Policy identified two of the policies that my cluster don't meet the requirements. Uh, so let's take a look at this one. So basically what's saying here is that I should have um, uh, the Azure guidance here is to use the threat detection capability of Azure Defender services in Microsoft Defender for Cloud for the respective Azure services. So what that means is that I don't have this enabled for my cluster. So in terms of scanning vulnerabilities and all the things that Microsoft Defender for Cloud does, it's not being applied to this cluster. And I don't have any way to know if something is uh, correctly configured or exposed or not. So I have the configuration of the policy here and I have the resource compliance. So I can see my VDAP cluster is non-compliant with this specific policy that by default is scanned for all Kubernetes cluster. So if I were to do this on premises by myself using any other tool, I would spend probably a day. And this was just a PowerShell command that I ran to enable the Azure policy configuration for that cluster. And now I have my uh, uh, cluster scanned uh, and all the configuration is now showing up here on the Azure portal. So keeping it nice and simple and streamlined, of course, right? Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, listen, thank you so much for that. That's absolutely fantastic. But now I'm afraid to say uh, we'll have to stop all that interesting stuff and come some fun stuff. And now we're going to go to a part of the show, uh, what we call the server acronym review. Uh, and like everyone involved in the tech world, uh, I just love a good, long, confusing acronym that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and luckily for us, the producers have found a few server ac acronyms to show us. Um, and we're going to put ourselves on the spot, you and I, Misius. Um, All so right. And guess what they are. Um, uh, we'd also love for you guys to pop your thoughts in the comment section below and tell us what you think about these acronyms. So let's go ahead and let's look at acronym number one, please. EFS. <laughs> Is it related to a file system? <laughs> Encrypted file system. There you go. That's, I think that's uh, it. You know what? I'll take your word for it. Um, I would have changed the first letter personally, but there we go. <laughs> yeah. This is an old one. I was it's going to say a component of Windows 2000, yes. <laughs> Blimey. That is going back some time, right? Well done. Yeah. Well done. Right. Let's move on to the I, next I, one. I, Shall I, we? I had a bunch of issues with EFS, by the way. <laughs> I know this one. Let me go. All Can right. I? Configuration Management Database. He's there. There we go. Look at that. All right. Uh, I, I, I used to work in tools that were very interconnected with the CMDB. So, uh, so yeah, that was kind of an easy one for me. Do we have any more? It brings back Mr. things like ITIL or something like that, right? Correct. Yes. ITIL certification. SCDPM. Now. I know this one. Then I think you've got to go. System Center I don't. Data Protection Management. Do you know something? I probably should have got that because I was looking at something around the DPM the other day. I just didn't quite connect them together. They were bad yeah. for me. Um, so let's just recap then, shall we? And I've kind of been trying to take some notes here, uh, but let's just keep it really simple. So Kubernetes is ultimately for deploying container-based applications. Um, and specifically for HCI is to put that at the edge for your on-premise footprint, um, enables you to spin them up quickly um, and 
it's something that's basically the, the platform is for the underlying infrastructure. Would that be correct to say in terms of the Kubernetes? It's bringing it all together to give you that underlying infrastructure to be able to run your container applications within Kubernetes. Would that be a fair statement? That is correct. That is correct. And, and the most important thing is that because it's all Microsoft, it's overly simplified so customers can easily deploy and manage that cluster uh, all with a, a tested and approved and blast Microsoft configurations. Excellent. Thank you for that clarification of my notes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, from an on-premise perspective, um, it supports all types of applications. Uh, we utilize pools that are designed for the OS specifically, such as Linux and Microsoft. And indeed, it can be integrated into Azure Arc, whereby you can set all your policies, such as Defender and so on and so forth, to make sure that that Kubernetes cluster will remain compliant. Fair statement? That's correct. Yes. Again, my notes are good. I'm impressed with myself. Thank you, Vinicius, <laughs> for validating. Um, so look, thanks so much for tuning into this episode. Thank you, Vinicius, again for today. Super insightful. Uh, gave me a bit of nostalgia in terms of getting that command line. Um, I'll be honest with you, I was a bit lost in certain areas, but you know, <laughs> that's why we bring the experts on, like you onto the show. Um, and you know, again, thanks to the audience for tuning into this episode of From Rock to the Cloud. Uh, again, keep an eye out right here on IT Ops Talk, LinkedIn, or YouTube for the next episode. And remember to drop your thoughts and comments below. We always love to see them and look forward to the next episode when we see you again. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks again, Vinicius.